much. Very glad to be here. I will be talking about uh, virtual currencies, sometimes called um, sort of, uh, cryptocurrencies, also by other words. And these are forms of money. I will talk about what money is. Over the last year, one of these cryptocurrencies has attained uh, really great eminence, namely Bitcoin. I expect most of you have heard about it. Bitcoins are things. Well, is it money? We'll address that question in a second. Not quite, but perhaps it will be money. But it certainly has gained a lot of prominence. It's worth a lot. As the latest market prices, all the Bitcoins in the world, around 10 million or so of them, were worth around $5 billion. So, a couple of years ago, the only originated about five years ago, a couple of years ago you could have bought one of these bitcoins for a few pennies. At its peak last year, the price was over a thousand dollars per year. And there's lots of money pouring in, venture capital money, uh, there's finance houses and so on, or financing startups or doing investment uh, funds and such like based on bitcoins. And there are of course various competitors. So is bitcoin going to be the future? Well, actually I don't know. I'm not going to advise you to invest in it. As the other, I will strongly advise you not to short it. Um, just because, based on my experience, human society sometimes does strange things, and shorting something like Bitcoin could be a quick road to ruin. It might bring you riches, but who, who knows? But, some, but something like Bitcoin, some kind of electronic currency, I suspect is going to be fairly significant. So I'll tell you a little bit about it. And I suspect that if you really want to kind of get a kick at the future of virtual currencies, see what it is that society is going to use, the place to go is Africa. And I'll explain to you in a second also. So this presentation is based to some extent on experience, and this is now the first time that uh, virtual currencies have become prominent. Um, that occurred over 20 years ago. I was actually involved in that early wave together with a summer intern who was working with me. We invented one of the electronic digital, no, payment systems that was patented by our employer. That one was marketed, but there were some others which were brought to market and I was involved in some of those things. And for the most part, they died out. And something like that may happen with Bitcoin, but maybe 20 years into the future, the next third generation may finally take over. So I can talk a little bit about what might happen. So what is money? First question. Well, that's a hard question to answer. Many people think of money as being these banknotes or coins that you get. Uh, banknotes with the visage of uh, Ben Franklin or George Washington or, or Abraham Lincoln on them and so on. But that's not necessarily the case. If you look at the economist's definition of money, it is a medium, a measure, a standard and a store. But not one of these says that it's issued by the government. So one of the things that really excites people about, say, Bitcoin or some of the other cryptocurrencies is that these systems are independent of governments, they are kind of maintained uh, or spread by the community, by users and so on. So, but these are kind of four functions, well, three if you really are picky about it, that money is supposed to fulfill. At the moment, Bitcoin doesn't fulfill any of them too well. As a medium of exchange, sort of, there are some, sorry, by now, some tens of thousands of retail outlets which will take Bitcoins, but it's also a little bit of a fake. As a store of value, no, it's not a very good store of value. Um, this year, 2014, price of a Bitcoin oscillated between about $350 and $1,000 or so. So it's not a very good store of value, unless, of course, you're one of these hyperinflation countries, you know, where inflation is rocketing 1,000% per month. Well, in that case, you might be happy to have some Bitcoins instead. But anyway, so these are the definitions of money. What has money uh, kind of been in the past? Well, a whole variety of things. In particular, sometimes it's been cowrie shells. Here is some money from 3,000 years ago in China. And this was not just in China, actually, in many areas of uh, you know, Africa, South Asia, and East Asia, these cowrie shells, many of them coming from the Maldives Islands, of the southwestern coast of, of India, have been used as currency. Beautiful shells, 
That would be rare, at least far away, 2,000 miles or 3,000 miles away in China, quite plentiful in the Maldives Islands, they work this money. No governments, at least initially in that case. Well, there are even stranger things that have served as money. In particular, as recently as 30 years ago, in Romania, under the oppressive uh, communist regime with the economy that was doing very poorly, the role of money was played by 10 cigarettes. The government was involved. In fact, the government made these things illegal. The black market basically ran on 10 cigarettes. Why 10 cigarettes and not Marlboros or any of the other brands? Beats me. <laughs> It beat everybody who's investigated this question too. Okay. Somehow Romanian society decided through the various network effects that we are so excited about on the internet that uh, cigarettes are going to work as money. Okay. Yet another example, just might also seem strange, but actually is very useful because it illuminates some of the things about cryptocurrencies, and in particular about Bitcoin, is this thing. Does it look like money? <laughs> These are stone coins of Yap. It's an island in the Pacific, um, sort of east of China, south of uh, Japan, roughly speaking. Uh, some, of these, uh, there are, some of them are small that you can carry around. Many of them are big, like this one. Some of them weigh up to four tons. They don't move. Uh, <laughs> Well, actually, they didn't move because they had to be brought to Yap. One of the things that gave them value is they were obtained, they were carved out of limestone on the island of Palau, 300 miles away, and brought over by a kind of fairly primitive wooden boat to Yap over these 300 miles of stormy Pacific Ocean, and that gave them certain rarity. How do you use transact uh, with any, anything uh, using these immovable coins? Well, you declare, declare in some presence of other witnesses that you're transferring ownership of one of these stones to another person. And the community kind of remembers it. So it's known that this stone belongs to you and that stone belongs to me and we might trade them and you'll give me a few pigs in exchange because my stone was more valuable or something like that. Okay. So these are not the very tangible coins and more tangible, bigger than what you're used to when you think about dollar bills. But there's actually even more interesting example which brings us closer to what we observe with some of our cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, namely a virtual currency. There's apparently at least one case where one of these stones, apparently a very nice stone that was being brought over from Palau, uh, sort of in a stormy weather, it kind of broke through the bottom of the, uh, of the boat and sank to the bottom of the ocean, a couple of miles down. Well, the natives of Yap decided that uh, this, this stone would work as a coin just as well as the ones that were visible. Everybody knew it was there. I mean, <laughs> nobody could see it, nobody could touch it, but it was there, and so ownership of, of it could be transferred. So when you think about this virtual currencies, these bit strings are floating out in the ether or residing on your flash drive on your computer, okay, here is something that more virtual. It doesn't even have bits on the magnetic storage. And it works as money. Well, okay, what about the present and the future? Well, there is actually a lot of electronic currency, of virtual currency in existence today. These days you have transitioned to credit cards and systems like PayPal. And what is a credit card? It's some stuff, some bits residing out someplace there, okay, in some bank account. You, know, you call up a merchant uh, and you kind of tell him you agree on a price, there's something you want to ship to you, and you tell them, okay, charge this credit card, here is the name of the credit card, here is the serial number, expiration date, security code, here is one, how much you, uh, you allow to charge me, and uh, you'll hang up the phone, two days later the goods arrive via FedEx or some other delivery service, and eventually you get the bill. No tangible money, right? Everything is kind of form of bits. 
So in some sense, we are already quite far along into sort of virtual currencies, things that are kind of residing out there, there is of take and faith because of certain bits stored inside of certain machines. What about going further? Well, some of these new cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin enable us to go even further in this direction and also to eliminate some of the costs and inconveniences even of the current system. Use your credit card, so in this case you call up your merchant and you tell the merchant to charge your credit card. Well, the merchant typically gets charged 2 or 3% by the credit card company, a whole chain of companies kind of that are involved in it, each one takes its uh, percentage, and that extra 2 or 3 percent, of course, gets in, built into the price that you are charged for that good or service that you have ordered. It's possible to eliminate it when we move to a more efficient system. So, how can you do it? Well, very high level overview. Okay, so Bitcoin, which I mentioned, just one of the many cryptocurrencies. Um, the basic technology is a triumph of the last 30-40 uh, years, a kind of, of research. A variety of very interesting mathematical techniques that have been developed to enable it. Something called one-way hash functions. You can kind of put things in, something comes out which gets published, and then you can prove that you are the only one who could have possibly, you know, uh, kind of created it. Uh, then you combine these one-way hash functions using Merkle trees to kind of get nice digests. Um, then you also have public key cryptography. You can sort of provide digital signatures. Then you're probably familiar with ordinary kind of physical signature. You write your name uh, kind of on a check for some other document. And then say your bank looks up your check, verifies that indeed it's you who signed it. Well, with digital signatures, you have the problem of reproducibility. Somebody might be able to copy the bits that you sent. So you have to provide some additional techniques. Again, that's been done south over 30 years ago. These things are all get combined to enable the kind of uh, Bitcoin transactions. And there are some other nice, nice things. You're going to take some, you know, many lectures or long courses to kind of learn all the details. But even high-level views can be obtained fairly easily. There are some very nice uh, kind of system of zero-knowledge proofs. I can prove to you that I know a particular secret without letting you know anything about that secret. So you'll not be able to prove to other people that you know that secret. It's a very non-trivial technology, okay, but it exists. And it's kind of all built into many of these other cryptocurrencies. An example, so again, very, very high level overview, this is, um, don't take it too, too, uh, literally, in systems like um, so of, uh, Bitcoin, what you have is um, kind of very uh, log of transactions. And remember, natives of YAP, how do they maintain knowledge of ownership communally? Somehow you told me that you transferred ownership of your stone coin and you told me in presence of witnesses and now the community knows that I'm the owner. Okay. Well, Bitcoin, that's actually one of the inventions of the Bitcoin inventors, um, sort of uh, was a system was proposed about five years ago by somebody or perhaps a group using the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto, except maybe it was not a pseudonym, who knows? There are quite a few Satoshi Nakamoto, no, nobody yet has been identified as the inventor of it. Uh, so the system was proposed, and one of the uh, innovations in it was that it uses essentially a public ledger of transactions. Okay. Just like the natives of YAP, okay, they have communal knowledge of who owns the various bits. In Bitcoin, you have a public record that's distributed all over the world. But unlike uh, the kind of community of YAP, which is small enough, most everybody knows everybody else, that's not the case in our uh, universe of nine, 9 billion people or so. So you, and also you do want to have certain anonymity for various transactions. So Bitcoin, and you can also do it in other cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin provides semi-tunnels uh, uh, transactions. Uh, so we have this record of transactions, and a typical element of such a record is kind of a, represented here symbolically by a line, and the line might say that owner of secret X is transferring 2345 satoshis to, to owner of secret Y. 
Satoshis are small units. Um, 100 million Satoshis to a Bitcoin. So, you know, Bitcoin right now is worth about $500. You're not going to be kind of buying too many things with units worth $500 each. So you want to have smaller units, they be called Satoshis. So in some sense, this is semi-anonymous. Semi uh, you don't really know who the owner of account X is. And in fact, if you acquire a stash of Bitcoins, you know, by purchasing them for dollars or euros or gold or maybe by a gift from somebody else, what you can do is you can now enter into this transaction ledger, a similar transaction where you send some of those Satoshis or Bitcoins to yourself. I own secret X, I also own secret Y, I kind of send the money in order to conceal what goes on. So it's not totally anonymous, you have a trace of which way the payment flow went, but you don't necessarily know kind of who owned various pieces of the total at the various stages. So that's kind of uh, quite nice. So I mentioned no governments involved. It's maintained by the community. In fact, again, there are some nice technical details. You need to have lots of people involved in maintaining the system. Namely, this ledger gets updated every once in a while. Yet you have to have lots of people running their computers. If more than half of the computing power that's involved in so-called mining the bitcoins is subverted, somebody gets control over it, that group or that individual could then kind of uh, control everything and uh, sweep up all of the bitcoins in the world. So there are some, uh, some issues about security as well. What about the future? Well, so bitcoin might be the future, at least part of the future in some parts of the world. Okay. On the other hand, at the moment, if you want to see the most advanced payment system, you should go to Africa. Okay. There is a system called M-Pesa. Uh, Pesa is Swahili for money, so on. And it's, a, well, very hard to illustrate because it's virtual. Again, you're talking about bits. It operates through cell phones and has very interesting properties. It's widespread, it's a kind of dominant payment system in countries like Kenya, Uganda, Ghana, and, and a few others at the moment. How did it arise? Again, not through actions of governments. Although governments are now involved, these things are kind of regulated, and PESA is regulated, it's become a formal system, but in the origins were in the societies, in those African countries. What, what happened is about a dozen years ago, some researchers looking at what was happening in the wireless phone systems in Africa, they observed that some of the inhabitants of those countries had developed, had developed a payment system out of them. They were trading minutes, airtime minutes, under cell plans with each other as a form of transferring value. It became a form of money. So it wasn't that some bright undergraduate at the EU or at Stanford had this idea, you know, quit, got venture capital funding, and went out to try to make money off all the poor Africans. No, it was the Africans themselves faced with a real crisis. They didn't have a functioning banking system. They didn't have anything that was more convenient. They invented one on the spot. So once the, the researchers observed it, then and they went in, developed it more formally. Now it's actual uh, kind of service, commercial service offered by several of the phone companies in that area. And the issue here is that those natives faced a crisis. It could also be among people, say even in the United States, but people that you don't, really don't think of as being at the cutting edge of technology. Okay. Who faces a crisis with payment system? Most of us have access to well-functioning systems. We have checking accounts, we have credit accounts, debit accounts, and so on. And mostly it works fairly well. And so yes, there is this you know, penny or two that you could shave off if you switch to a new system, but you know, it's a penny or two, half of a dollar, and you know, might have some extra inconveniences. All the kind of inertia and everything goes into it as well. Many of you probably still recognize what this is, wristwatch. I have encountered quite a few students who just wonder, why do I wear a wristwatch? Okay. I mean, we wear a cell phone. Everybody has a cell phone, right? A cell phone has a much more accurate watch than this wristwatch. What's the point of it? Well, inertia. I am old. 
and all, somewhat old-fashioned, okay? and also convenient. I mean, I don't have to pull out my cell phone, I just glance at my wristwatch. Okay? So I stick with it. Young people, I increasingly see, they don't wear wristwatches. They just get along with uh, just a cell phone. Something similar may be happening with payment systems. So yes, okay, we have credit cards, but the easy practice, we have a wallet, you know, fat wallet full of credit cards. You have to pull them out, select the right one, give it to the merchant. Okay? We already have a cell phone. Why not have all the stuff on a cell phone? Why not move over to some kind of a virtual currency that runs over the one device we definitely are going to have with us? So I think there's promise. The greater convenience, slightly lower costs. So I think even in the general society, there is likely to be progress of virtual currencies. But it might be much higher among some of the underserved uh, communities. If you look at many of the migrants, people kind of working very often for menial wages, agriculture, other places, when they want to send money back home to other countries, they often face staggeringly high charges from you know, money transfer agencies like the Western Union. They might become some of the first adopters of advanced payment systems. So, there is a lot of technologies there. Uh, we can do a variety of different things uh, with it. Uh, will we go for systems like Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies? So to some extent it's very likely we will, but it's not absolutely certain. Remember, convenience reigns supreme, it, and also people do like to have anonymity, they would like to be free of governments, at least some libertarian-minded people would do and so on. On the other hand, they may decide they don't even want to bother using cell phones. As we move forward, as technology advances, as biometrics uh, is improved, what might happen is you go into Starbucks, uh, kind of you order your frappuccino, uh, the barista, will be a robotic barista in a few years, undoubtedly, tells you, you know, your bill is uh, $5.67, and you, you simply speak to the air, yes, please pay $5.67 to the Starbucks outfit out of my account, uh, uh, so uh, uh, my orange out, uh, account. It's, like, it's not feasible today yet, uh, kind of the biometrics, voice recognition, uh, kind of iris scans and other things uh, are not quite to the stage where we can do it, but very soon we will. And so perhaps that's what people will go for. Maybe they will decide that anonymity doesn't matter to them, but they would really like to be able to kind of work without having to pull out a cell phone to pay for their frappuccino. So technolo technologists propose but society disposes. In the past, faced with particular technological choices, society used a variety of things. They used cowrie shells, they used canned cigarettes, they used stone discs of yap. What are they going to use in the future? Well, it's certainly going to be something convenient, something that at least behind the scenes will use a lot of electronics and a lot of modern technologies, but a precise form of the technology that is hard to predict. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.